Alrighty. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the Allegheny County Policing Project, Police Contracts and Barriers to Accountability session of the Pittsburgh Racial Justice Summit this morning. Um, we're very happy to have everybody in here. Um, so Allegheny County has 130 self-governing municipalities and 108 police departments and some with as few as six officers. Uh, and so this fragmentation of policing obstructs accountability and the Allegheny County Police Policing Project aims to serve as a resource uh, for demystifying the processes that happen as well as providing a library of contracts for public use. So this session is aiming to introduce the ACPP tool and demonstrate how users can navigate uh, municipal police departments, uh, explore interactive maps, search police contracts um, for specific language, and learn, learn more about the process of filing a misconduct complaint as well. Um, and so with us today to go through some of this, we have our facilitators. We have Hannah Genovese, uh, Blair Mickles, and Emmeline Ryle today. So Hannah, whenever you are ready, you can take it away. Alrighty, thank you. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Um, I know I looked at my phone this morning and it was four degrees here in Pittsburgh. So I hope everybody's like managing to stay warm and everything too. <laughs> Um, so like we mentioned, um, we are Allegheny County Policing Project, um, and we are a working group within the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School for Public and International Affairs. Um, and we're here to just talk to you today a little bit about what we do um, and specifically introduce um, a little bit about our um, police contracts and complaints tool that we launched um, in November of last year. So um, yeah, I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Great. Okay, so um, yeah, my name is Hannah Genovese and I'm here with my co-presenters, Blair Mickles, Emmeline Ryle, and Eliana Beagle. Um, and so I'll just quickly introduce myself. Um, I am a master's in public administration student with the University of Pittsburgh at Gispia. Um, I am majoring in urban affairs and planning, um, and I'm really interested in issues of housing affordability and policing in the Pittsburgh area. Um, I am also, I, I joined ACPP in the fall of 2021, um, and this year I am also a co-program manager at ACPP, along with um, Emmeline Ryle, so I will go ahead and let them introduce themselves now. Hi everybody, I'm Emmeline Ryle. Um, as Hannah said, I'm also a co-program manager with ACPP. Um, I've been with uh, Grief to Action, which is the overall working group since um, the summer of 2020. So I've kind of been here since the beginning um, and I kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, I was a math and computer science major in undergrad. So I kind of helped with the tech team and then have been getting increasingly involved with the policy side of things. Um, so we also have Blair Mickles and Eliana Beagle with us today. Um, I'm going to let Eliana introduce themselves because they were also a program manager in the past. So we'll go through that direction. Thank you, Emmeline. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm Eliana. Um, I have also been with Brief to Action since June 2020. And we'll talk about how we formed, but it, it was in reaction to George Floyd. And we really wanted to take a look at police violence locally. Um, yeah, I was a uh, program manager for the first year and a half, and I have handed off to the very, very capable hands of Hannah and Emmeline. Over to Blair. Well, hello, I am Blair Mickles. I am also a student at Gispia as well as a School of Social Work. And I've been with the project since June 2020, I think that's when it started. Um, but I also, I guess my role within this is I'm kind of, I'm a longtime Allegheny County resident, uh, born, partially raised here, and 
a lot of, I guess, my role in this is kind of the community um, liaison as well to make sure that we are working in the best interest of the community and not just the university. Alrighty, thank you. Um, and then just to go into a very brief agenda of what we're going to be going over today, um, we're going to just give a quick intro um, to the Center for Analytical Approaches to Social Innovation, or CASI for short, um, and Allegheny County Policing Project, which is, uh, you know, the specific project within CASI. Um, and then we're going to go into an overview um, and some context of the climate of policing in Allegheny County. Um, we will go through a live walkthrough of our contract and complaint tool. Um, and then we want to leave ample time for questions um, and discussion as well. Um, so a little bit about CASI. Um, they were founded in the fall of 2019 by our um, faculty uh, sponsor Sarah Lenardi. Um, and our mission is to create a community of learning and practice, um, a lot of emphasis on that practice, um, of people who are passionate about a specific social justice issue, namely policing, um, to co-develop and deploy online tools, such as um, our contract and complaint tool, which we will demo later, um, and to incubate ideas for quantitative research projects. Um, here's a list of some of those projects um, that have been undertaken in the past. Um, today, we do want to focus specifically on Grief to Action, or G2A for short. Um, so Cassie Grief to Action started in the summer of 2020 um, in direct response, um, as Eliana said, to the summer of protest and the murder of George Floyd. Um, it's a group of students, um, staff, and um, largely volunteers um, to undertake community-initiated projects against systemic racism. Um, our meetings are virtual, so they are open to all. Um, if anybody is interested in attending, um, just email cassie at pitt.edu for our Zoom link, um, and we would love to have you. Um, in any iteration of the project, we've had um, any combination of 150 volunteers so far. Um, so again, this is a very volunteer driven project. Um, how we work um, is we, we go through sort of this um, cycle of problem scoping, prototype development, and then we get feedback on what we've worked on. Um, so our weekly community meetings, like I said, are gonna be um, virtual. They are every Friday at noon. Um, and we've been meeting every Friday at noon, more or less, um, constantly since that summer of 2020. Um, we always begin with five minutes of mindfulness at the top of our meetings. Um, we're aware that sometimes the subject matter can get pretty heavy, so we do want to make space for people to just kind of center themselves. And, um, and so, yeah, that takes place in the form of uh, mindful breathing and also just five minutes of meditation as well. Um, we have a very flat structure, so there's not too much hierarchy going on. Um, and we try to keep in mind not to use too much jargon, um, just because, you know, this is a largely volunteer centered project. Um, and, you know, we want to make everything accessible to people. So, um, and we always make sure too, if there is some sort of terminology or anything that's not going to be, um, blatantly obvious to people. Um, we do want to make sure that we go through that and make sure everybody's on the same page as far as understanding. Um, next, we'll go to prototype development. And within that area, we do have specialized subgroups. So we have a data collection group, um, a content group, tech team group, and then engagement as well, depending on what is the specific project we're working on at that moment. Um, so after we have a prototype, we do make sure to get feedback um, in, the, in the form of user studies, um, presentations to the community, article submissions. Um, and also this year we have a class as well within GISPIA. So um, that class is called um, Working with Public Interest Technology. And that class is gonna be just basically centered on this process. So now to the story of the Allegheny County Policing Project. Um, so the, on the right is a screenshot of the homepage of our contract um, and complaint tool. Um, and the story of how this came to be is one of 
uh, police misconduct and the accountability or lack thereof that um, results from that. Um, and unfortunately, when it comes to inc incidents of police misconduct and accountability, there are several um, levels of kind of cloudiness that can obfuscate that process for people. Um, and it makes it really hard for just, you know, the average citizen to navigate those, um, that process that might come about from, you know, an incident of police misconduct. Um, unfortunately, there are some legal protections that um, a police union might afford to um, an officer involved in an incident of police misconduct. Um, and those stem a lot from those the police contracts um, that officers will have with the union. So um, these police contracts, not only are they difficult to obtain, um, they also um, contain a lot of jargon. They are difficult to understand um, by the lay person and, you know, difficult to analyze. Um, so that also, you know, adds to that level of um, sort of cloudiness that comes from, from these incidents. And then, you know, the cherry on top of everything is going to be the political fragmentation um, that is present in, within Allegheny County. Um, Allegheny County, like was mentioned earlier, um, doesn't just consist of Pittsburgh, right? So we also have 130 municipalities that surround um, the, the city of Pittsburgh. And they each, um, most of them, there's about 108 uh, police uh, departments that um, each of those municipalities have. Um, some of them, you know, have as little as six officers. So of course, like that can present some real difficulties um, to people who, you know, might have a commute to work. And, and, you know, throughout that commute, they traverse about maybe two or three of those municipalities. So. Um, yeah, at this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to Blair, um, and she can go a little bit further into uh, depth into some of the context of uh, policing Allegheny County. Right, so we've all heard about police misconduct. However, for background information, what exactly is police misconduct? The California Innocence Project defines it as illegal or unethical actions or the violation of individuals' constitutional rights by police officers and the conduct of their duties. So a lot of words, you can basically read that right there. What type of situations are we looking at? If we were to bring it here to Allegheny County, I think a lot of people are familiar with what happened with um, Jim Rogers and the Pittsburgh Police Department where he was tased entirely too many times to deny medical care. That is considered police misconduct. We've heard of stories such as um, uh, other names that might be a little bit more familiar in the area, everybody from Romero Talley, people from, and it doesn't even necessarily have to result in death, Johnny Gamage, who was the inspiration for this whole summit to even begin with, as well as a uh, personal friend of mine, Leon Ford, and plenty of others uh, in the area. But like I said, they, you know, in Leon's case, it didn't necessarily end in death or whatever. But so it can be everything from false arrest, assault, um, as previously mentioned. And basically, it, it, it's fairly common because there's not necessarily that much oversight and everything. So what we want to look at are, you know, basically... Yes, recognizing what police misconduct is is the first step to understanding this. And then what I think you'll find a little bit later with our tool and the reason we're kind of talking about this is ways to address that because it largely goes unchecked nationwide and here within Allegheny County as well, which brings us to let's kind of get to know Allegheny County just a little bit here. Next slide. Okay, sorry. So uh, as Hannah had mentioned, Allegheny County is very fragmented. Here's just a map for reference with Pittsburgh highlighted. So you can see all of, I honestly cannot tell you what every single square in Alleg well, not square, but every single municipality in Allegheny County is. There's a ton of them. I can almost give you every country in the world, but not every municipality in Allegheny County because that's the way it is. Um, 
So this project does focus on Allegheny County. However, like I said, as you can see, each of these represent the different police departments, the municipal departments. And then if you want to go on top of that, then you can start adding in the non-municipal police, such as the Port Authority police, the hospital police, the school police, the university police. And I think you see where this is going here. And fun part, none of them abide by the same rules. So this is also just a breakdown a little bit of the population. As you can see, Pittsburgh is in the middle, but the darker, uh, the first map on your left is showing the percentage of white residents in Allegheny County. And uh, the picture on your right is showing the percentage of black residents in Allegheny County. And you can see that there are some uh, disparities here within where they live, which will all make sense once we look at the next couple of maps. So take a good idea of where they are. And this is where the income is. You'll also notice the darker colors here kind of correlated with some of the darker colors on the other, the previous map that we looked at. And the lighter colors, basically the lower income, higher is higher income, darker is higher income, of course. And then on to the next one, which will um, give us a little bit more insight is this is how much police departments a lot uh, how much of the municipal budget is allotted to the police department. My cat has stuff to say as well, but um, he is not signed up for this event, so I will ignore him. Um, so as you can see, there are municipalities here within Allegheny County that are spending over 40% of their budget on policing. Mind you, some of these are a little bit wealthier, but also some of these are smaller areas that tend to be over policed. So what can you do if something goes wrong? Can you complain? Absolutely, you can complain. There is the Office of Municipal Investigations who is basically operated by the government. So they're not necessarily a um, impartial board per se, but they do take, uh, they do conduct investigations into complaints of officer misconduct. You also have the Citizens Police Review Board who, uh, some people say it's too strong. Some people say it's too weak, but they both have different processes, funding, oversight, and power, which means that the information can be found across multiple sites. So let's just say you are fine audience. Let's say you go out into this fine Allegheny County world on a beautiful, crisp winter day, and an officer does not behave as appropriate, and you decide you want to file a complaint. Should, should be fairly easy, right? Imagine you want to file a complaint and this is the information that you are given. Might crush your feelings just a little bit, right? However, I think that you'll find with our new shiny tool designed specifically for Allegheny County, you will be able to um, find the process a little bit more streamlined and be able to be functional in filing a complaint. So I will pass it over and you can learn how we can help. Thanks, Blair. So um, as Blair was saying, uh, filing a police complaint right now, the way that this process is set up is kind of inherently confusing and overwhelming. And this is, you know, exacerbated by the fact that like local context is really important. So nationally, these complaints are filed differently. So the first goal of the tool we wanted to address was demystifying this whole process in Pittsburgh. Um, and so we did that by identifying these five steps and sort of simplifying this so that you can access this information in a way that is not overwhelming, um, and is, you know, easy to access. Um, I think there's one more slide on this. Um, and so we have the five steps laid out here, and then we'll go over this a little bit later when we look at the website live, um, but we've split it up into these five steps and then explain what happens in each of these steps and then answer some frequently asked questions. Um, but even if you get through these steps and you file a complaint, um, there are still ways for the police to avoid accountability. Um, and so one of those ways is with police unions. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Eliana to speak on this. Thank you. 
Yeah, all right. So uh, we've shown you a bit of how the complaint process can be pretty confusing. Um, so I'm going to give some concrete examples of ways that it can go wrong that relate to police unions. Um, so unions in general, I love them. <laughs> you know, uh, there is the role of to protect people's wages, protect their jobs, make sure that they have benefits. Um, however, police unions um, tend to get away with a lot. Um, when your role is to protect people who occasionally murder other people, sorry, I need to call it too early for this. Um, <laughs> we're gonna calm down. Yeah, um, so police unions, uh, their job is to protect the jobs of police. So their job is often to cover up. Um, there's a lot of academic research on this. Um, I won't go through all of it. I'm sure you folks can take my word for it <laughs> that when there is less accountability and misconduct will increase. Um, and it's really important to think about these unions because most police officers belong to them. Um, so by that approximation, um, 75 to 80% of police officers belong to unions. So all of them uh, generally have these protections. So we, we have talked about how it can vary, contra um, policies vary a lot between different municipalities, but a lot of these protections are standard all across the country. And uh, Oh, sorry, I am not. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, we're going to be talking about the contracts specifically, the union contracts that uh, the the union signs with the city or municipality. So this is the cover of the Pittsburgh Police Union contract. Um, so yeah, between the city of Pittsburgh and between the Fraternal Order of Police, which is the name of the union. You, if you've heard of a police union, it probably is the FOP. Um, fun fact about Pittsburgh is we are home of the very first uh, Fraternal Order of Police Lodge. Um, and one interesting thing to note, though, is that uh, there is a term of the contract. So these are renegotiated every couple of years, which is really good to know because there's some things in there that you might you might want changed. <laughs> All right, next slide. Oh, um, so they are legal documents. Uh, they can be really overwhelming at first. I know we've, we've said it, it can be very complicated and there's jargon. And um, so it, it, it can seem very overwhelming and it can even seem like boring. Like, what is this? I don't, uh, but there, there's a lot of actually really important, interesting things in there. Um, so for example, I've highlighted here the chapter on police discipline procedures. Um, it's pretty interesting if you read it and uh, all of this is available online through our website. Um, I will actually respond very quickly um, to the question from Emily in the chat. Um, so most of these contracts, um, we had to submit right to know requests um, to the municipalities. Um, technically, the public is entitled to them because they're they're like government contracts, but most places don't post them and a lot of places don't want to share them. So we submitted a lot, a lot of right to know requests, um, but we were able to get them and they are legally obligated to give them to you if you ask. Okay, ready for the next one. Ooh, all right, so what are some specific things in these contracts? Um, actually, a lot of the things that um, make people very, very angry whenever understandably, whenever there is an, an incident of police violence, um, for example, Jim Rogers that uh, Blair brought up, um, the officer, um, Keith Edmonds, was immediately placed on paid administrative leave. Um, that's the kind of thing that makes people very upset. It's like, oh, well, you, you just killed someone and you get to go like get paid. You know, it feels very unfair or um, they fired that officer and then they hired him right back. Right, all these things that seem very frustrating or like, oh, he had all these complaints against it, but no one, um, there's a reason those things happen. And it is largely because of clauses in these contracts. And again, they're legal documents. So the city has agreed to follow them. So it, it gets real sticky. Um, a, a national organization called Campaign Zero that does uh, a lot of work on police violence identified um, six different types of barriers to accountability. I won't read all these, but I will go through them um, with little examples of 
types of language that again are standard in these contracts. You'll see that many of the ones that we've collected have these barriers. Um, ready for the next one. All right, so um, I'll apply this to the misconduct complaint process. So we talked briefly about the complaint process in Pittsburgh, and then we'll compare that to what's in the contract. So um, you looked at our tool, you decided you're ready to submit a complaint. Um, however, let's say that this happened four months ago. You, you can't submit it. Um, citizen complaints are meant to be filed within 90 days. Um, generally, if you submit a pass that point, your complaint will be dismissed. So off the bat, um, they're already automatically disqualifying some complaints, which is troubling. So then let's say your complaint is accepted and they do want to investigate. Um, it'll go to the Office of Municipal Investigation, which is like a city department. And they will start an investigation, but first they're gonna let that officer know that they're going to be investigating him, sorry, or her. <laughs> they're going to be investigating that person, um, which uh, is certainly not a courtesy given to uh, ordinary people who are accused of crimes. Um, all right. Um, additionally, when the interview um, actually begins, um, uh, the, the officer has to be told the nature of, of the interrogation. So if I'm interviewing you because I think your partner did something wrong, I can just tell you that up front. If I'm interviewing you because I think you are in trouble, like I would have to tell you, like just so you know, like we might have to arrest you. Like they they literally will like warn them, like be careful what you say, which and that's that's just legally part of the contract. So also <laughs> can be problematic. Um, and another thing that um, that often frustrates people during these investigations is like we know this officer did this. Um, to use again the, the example of Officer Keith Edmonds who killed Jim Rogers, uh, we know this person did this and we're really mad and we wanna know the city is doing something, right? That's completely understandable uh, to be, you know, tweeting at Mayor Peduto or now Mayor Ganey saying, you know, you gotta do something. But uh, the city is literally legally not able to say anything about the investigation except yes, they're under investigation or no, they're not. So that information is kept from the public, which again is very troubling because you probably want to know if there's a violent person in your neighborhood. But, okay, let's say your complaint is accepted, it's investigated, and they actually decide, okay, you're right, there was misconduct here. However, <laughs> uh, city money that your taxes go to is what's going to be like, paying for that legal time. Um, so as you can see here, um, every year, the city of Pittsburgh gives $100,000 to this fund, um, specifically run by the FOP, specifically to protect police officers. Um, so again, you're, you're essentially paying the city to investigate a city employee <laughs> uh, who hurt you. So it's, again, it's, it's a whole mess. Um, and, um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, um, these contracts also have really strict rules about keeping records on discipline. Um, so you go through it, it's accepted, it's investigated. They decide, yes, that officer did do that. We want to put a note in their file. You know, maybe even we're gonna suspend them. Maybe there is serious discipline. Um, however, uh, within a period of several years, um, they will delete that from the file. Um, if it's a written reprimand, it'll be three years. Um, if it's something more serious, like a suspension, it might be like five years, um, but they, they are thrown out regularly and uh, they're also not available to the public. So, not a lot of transparency. And um, I, it also can get in the way of advocacy a lot, I think, when folks don't know 
who to talk to or, or why something is happening, right? Because it just seems like, why are you paying this guy to go do nothing? He's in trouble, right? So it, this, uh, it, it can help you sort of see the contours of like how to, uh, how to better navigate the system. I think I'm done. <laughs> oh, I did. Yeah. Okay, so at this point, um, I will go ahead and stop sharing. Um, and then I will also post a link to our tool in the chat. Um, and then oops, I will turn it over to Emmeline to go ahead and do our demo. Okay, so thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Eliana. Um, so now that we have a lot of the context for why this tool was created, um, uh, it's in, I think Hannah's posting it in the chat. So I have some uh, inside intel from the tech team that even though this is functional on both mobile and desktop, uh, it is best viewed on desktop right now. So if you're playing along at home, you might want to <laughs> use desktop. Um, so when you come to the homepage of the website, as we saw before, this is what you get. Um, and our website does three like main things. You can explore a police department map that shows the um, local municipalities. Um, you can search the police contracts that we, that Eliana was talking about, that we've created a database for, or you can look through the police complaint FAQ. Um, so I'm going to go through this kind of in the order we introduced it in the in the slides. Um, so starting with the complaint FAQ, this is those steps of filing a police misconduct complaint that we have simplified so that, you know, you don't have to look at that horrible big thing that Blair introduced um, that is complete overwhelming. Um, so starting with the interaction, uh, I won't go through like every little detail of this process, but like um, the five steps will explain what happens in that stage. So interaction, you have an encounter with the police that you don't feel too good about. Um, and then we provide some answers to frequently asked questions about this part in the process. So, you know, know your rights at this part. Um, what is police misconduct? Like what, what actually quantifies is that? Um, should I be filing something? Um, and then the next step is the complaint. Um, and we did get this information from the Office of Municipal Investigations and the Citizens Police Review Board. Um, so this is coming from there, but um, we go over like, how do you file with them? Can you file anonymously? Do you need a lawyer? Stuff like that. Um, the review process, um, once you get to that stage, investigation, um, you know, what are the steps? How do I know what stage my complaint is at? Stuff like that. And you guys can, you know, look through this in your own time based on what your interests are, where you um, are looking at, and then the result. So this is the FAQ page. Um, and this is sort of to help get you started with this. Um, the next aspect to our tool are the police contracts. So if you have never seen a contract before, which you all have now a little bit, as Eliana introduced you, but <laughs> if you've never looked at one before, you don't know what you're looking at, you don't know what it means, we have a little guide here, which I'm not going to click on it now because it will open up a new tab, um, but that is a guide for reading a police contract so that you can get some idea and get a little bit familiar with, with that process. Um, if you are more familiar with contracts and if you wanna look at some of the words that um, Eliana had brought up uh, talking about Campaign Zero, we have a search bar where you can look for specific language in these contracts. So you can either click on these buttons that will look for that specific word or you I'm can- sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you really quickly because I just realized yeah, I ahead. forgot to provide really important context. <laughs> Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Back when I was doing my bit there, you may have noticed that there were words that were highlighted and I just completely forgot to mention they are highlighted because we found when those words showed up a lot, it tended to be in that context. So we found whenever the word unfounded came up, it was in the context of um, anonymous complaints are unfounded, we throw them out. Uh, complaints submitted after 90 days are too late, we throw them out. So that's, sorry about that. Back to Emily. Yeah, so 
as Eliana was saying, on this um, contract page, if you scroll down, we do have the six categories uh, listed here, and we explain sort of what those are. So for instance, unfair access to information is language that falls under this category, gives officers access to information that civilians do not get prior to the interrogation. And so one of the keywords that we picked out that pertains to that is interrogation. So if you click on this button, it'll take you back to that search page that I had showed you before. And this will search for all of the police contracts that we have in our database, which are the ones in Allegheny County that contain the word interrogation. And so the results that you'll see here will show you the a link to the contract and then a little blurb about like where this word is found in the police contract. Um, and so you can click on this here and it'll take you to a page where you can look at, so this is Avalon Borough. You can look at Avalon Borough's um, police contract uh, directly in the browser. You can also download it as a PDF or a text file in case you wanna use this for your own you know, personal use. Um, and then we also have a little uh, table here with some basic information about Avalon Borough. Um, so we have like the full-time officers as of 2019, because these, these do get updated, um, police budget percentage in 2019, and a link to the police department website. Um, so that is what you can do with that. And the website is pretty self-referential. So if you go to the um, search bar and you're looking at these words and you're not really sure what they mean, you can also click here to go back to the contract page and get that context. So usually at, some, at any point on the website, if you're confused about why we're using certain language or why we have set something up a certain way, there should be something on that page that explains and gives justification for that. Um, and then the final piece is the police department map. So here we have a map of Allegheny County with all of our um, municipalities here. And this allows you to click on um, wherever you want in Allegheny County. So let's say you wanna look at Plumborough, it'll bring up a little blurb about Plumborough, a link to the police department, similar to what we saw on the contract page, full-time police officers, do they have a police bill of rights, um, police budget, what keywords that we identified from those six are in that police contract, and then a link back to that contract page. So like I said, it's pretty self-referential. You can get back to there from here, you can get from there to here. Um, and then in addition to clicking on the map directly, we also have them on the side. So say you don't know where Plumborough is on the map, but you wanna look at Plumborough, you can find it down here and click on it from there. Um, yeah, and so the other thing that we have um, is, I can't show it on the website because we did do some last minute bug fixes that um, caused this part to stop working. But if you look down here, and I'll show a screenshot in a second. If you look down here, we have those six keywords again. And the functionality is you'll be able to click on those and it will highlight um, on the map which municipalities have those uh, words in their police contracts. So I'm going to swap over to the slide that shows this. Um. And while you do that, I saw another question pop up in the uh, question. Oh, yeah, sorry, I can't uh, the questions. Oh, not a problem. Kimmy asked a question about why is uh, police budget reported as a percentage and what is it a percentage of? It's reported as a percentage because as you could tell with each of the municipalities, you might have a municipality like Ross Township or something where they spend a larger budget on policing and so forth. But it's a total of the overall municipality's budget. So for instance, in a smaller community, like let's just say Braddock, for instance, them spending 50% of their budget would not necessarily even equate one of the larger township spending 10% of their budget because it's based off of each municipality's budget. So each budget is different. One might have a thousand dollar budget and one might have a million dollar budget. So it's a percentage of their respective budgets. I hope that helps a little bit and I didn't confuse anyone. Yeah, great question. Um, thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, 
so this is the this is the final piece that I wanted to show from the website. Um, this is what it will look like in a few days from now when we fix it. Um, and so it'll just allow you to click on those that language and see like where these patterns are emerging across the contracts in Allegheny County. Um, so I do want to say that while this uh, project did start as an initiative at the University of Pittsburgh, it's really important to us that this tool is serving the community and activists in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. So um, I'm going to let Blair talk about how community feedback has played a really integral role in the development of this tool. Absolutely. And if it's OK, again, there was another really great question that came up uh, from Emily. Is there a way to analyze the racial, gender, demographics of officers in specific boroughs, municipalities? Alternatively, is there any way to know that officers are shuffled between municipalities and move for protection? Emily, well, that would never happen. That would you never. Are, <laughs> you are absolutely going to hate my answer. The first part is actually no. They uh, do not release certain demographic information. They, they might, some municipalities might give a breakdown, like the city of Pittsburgh might give that, but a lot of that, and any of the public services as well, a lot of that is pretty numb. Um, Mom, I'm working on another project for um, firefighting, and this is information that just they just will not release publicly unless they're facing a crisis. And is there a way to know if officers are shuffled between municipalities and move protection, move for protection? I would almost like, I would love to say yes, which uh, I guess my best answer for this is they're not really going to tell you. They have no real obligation. They don't really even know because they don't communicate with each other. So my advice on that one is just assume that they are. A lot of police officers, especially in these smaller municipalities, are working simultaneously at two, three different departments. And they just, you know, they might, let's just say for instance, they were at a university police department. They might get shuffled to a small municipal police department. And there's not really, there has been legislation presented to try to have a database of police misconduct, but you know, just hypothetically speaking, they can move from a university to a municipality and shoot a teenager in the back. Okay. Theoretically. Oh, theoretically speaking. Um, so I will go ahead and start the next slide because I just really sum up. So yeah, uh, so you guys are probably thinking, okay, yeah, that's cute. A bunch of university, like super academic people have created this tool for other academics and so forth, but I would like to say not necessarily the case. We, of course, you know, with our ties to the community and everything, we want to make sure that we're not just making something that's pretty that we can slap our name on that we can slap on the university website. That does us no good. If you guys are not aware, if y'all are not aware of this tool and y'all aren't using it, then it makes it you know, basically something to collect dust on a shelf. So we were very conscious to go out into the community and speak with various people in a community. We met, uh, we met in spring 2021 with community activists from different organizations, some organizations that you guys may have heard of in the communities. We'll get a little bit into some of those, but we wanted to know what they wanted. We had this big, burning idea to use our big brains to do great, but left to our own devices, that's going to stay in a vacuum. So we went out into the community. We spoke with people. We asked them, what can we do? What do you want? They expressed the need for a tool like this. And they provided strong feedback on the tool. Um, part of the reason they said we need a tool is, and these are actual direct quotes from some of the conversations, people are being violated and they don't even know it. Another one is because if you file a complaint and nobody knows if like any of the officers were disciplined, which, you know, is something that we all kind of want to know if someone hit me in the face and I told, I would want to know that they faced discipline, much less if they've got a badge and a gun, um, much more actually. Um, you know, so we created the tool, we got feedback, they, the consolidated information they found to be super helpful. 
another direct quote, because I love this one, some stages are pretty text heavy. It's a lot for people to read through. So we took that and tried to give smaller bites. And we did, uh, the website was designed to serve two audience, actually multiple audiences. It's supposed to serve regular everyday individuals like you and I, just people out on the streets. And it's also designed for people like researchers that want to take this information and go even deeper with it. So we have it kind of on two levels, but we have it simultaneously on two levels. So that way, um, if you want that additional information, you can go find that. But if you just want the basics, it's there and it's easy to read without a lot of heavy dig digging. Researchers, you're going to have to dig a little bit more because that's what we do anyway. Um, and then in the fall of 2021, we compiled groups of four experts to do uh, some user testing. So they addressed issues raised in the previous studies to create the improved tool. And they basically, before our site went live, they got to kind of play around with it, get a natural feel for it and make sure, you know, that it is something that my neighbor, Bob, can use. Because at the end of the day, we want Bob to be empowered to be able to take on these systems by himself if he needed to. And if he's not comfortable, that's why we work with local activist organizations so that they can would also know how to do this and be able to assist Bob if he came to them for assistance. And Bob is not my actual neighbor. I have no neighbor named Bob. Um, so yes, activist expertise is essential and it takes time to build trust early. Well, build trust, period. So we have been fostering relationships slowly, not forcing anything and definitely being very um, responsive to their needs, their concerns, their complaints, because essentially this is a tool that was created in their minds that we kind of built into a tangible, we brought their imaginations into reality and we asked them, what would you like? And this is what they came up with. I love our brilliant community. And next slide, please. And yeah, so uh, we do actually have a few, in case you're wondering, like some of the people that have spoken out about this. I mean, yes, we start off, you know, a little more, not necessarily as local, but nationally campaign zero, Nix the six, which are those six words that Ileana brought up regarding the, um, the misconduct and so forth. So they, campaign zero has endorsed this, but also for bringing it a little bit closer to home, we've got um, if you've heard of Take Action Mon Valley, Fawn, uh, Fawn Montgomery Walker from Take Action Mon Valley has had some feedback and comments and has aided in the development and provided needs for her community. And we also have uh, Jerry Dickinson, who is a law professor at the University of Pittsburgh as well, who advises a lot of activist groups on efforts and others that has also had some uh, wonderful things to say about this. So basically, like I said, we want to make this a community project and community feedback is always welcome. If there's something that someone would like to see, they're always able to submit, you know, ideas and say, hey, this will be cool. That'll be cool. And if it's something that we can do, we've got the expertise. Uh, well, they do. I am not a tech person. We have a tech team that has expertise to make that happen. We have contracts guru that's able to kind of make you know, certain things happen and everything. So we are using our collective talents to be able to bring this to the community. And we want you guys to be empowered to take action when necessary and even know when action needs to be taken. So I will pass it off to my, um, um, my friends here. Yeah, so um, with all that said, um, like we mentioned earlier, our meetings are open to all. We are always looking for people to join us. Um, and, you know, we can take a wide range of skills, um, writing skills, research skills, legal knowledge, technical knowledge, like whatever skill you have, we can probably use it. Um, so Grief to Action meets every Friday at uh, noon and it's open to everybody, whether you can participate um, for just one for one week um, in, in total or for a whole year, you can make an impact with us. So um, again, email us at cassie at pit.edu for our Zoom link um, or to be just included on our email list. So thank you again, everybody, for um, listening to our presentation. Um, and at this point, we can go ahead um, and open it up to any questions you guys might have. I actually have a question. 
So if if somebody goes on your website with the intent of of navigating that tool, it does look super user friendly. But if somebody gets to that point and they're confused or they have a question, what um, what routes should they take for that? Do we? Oh, so Emmeline, you want to take that? Sorry. That's a great question. Um, I think on our website, uh, there is, uh, I didn't go over this just because it wasn't as relevant to the demo of the tool, um, but there is a contact page. So if you get to that page and you don't know what's going on, you can either email us at the email that um, Hannah mentioned, uh, cassie at pit.edu. Um, and then there's also like an about page there as well that kind of describes the tool a little bit if you have like found yourself on the website through some other means. Awesome. We, uh, we also just have a, a little list of, um, on that same about page of uh, further resources of like local um, racial justice, police accountability groups that you could try to get in touch with who might have answers, um, like Abolitionist Law Center, APA. We do have a question in the chat from Tim. Um, he asks, is this geared toward complaints about individual officers or can it also be applied to groups of officers? Um, goes on the same thinking about a couple of summers ago, there were large groups of police officers, right? Sometimes in unmarked riot gear, um, which protected their identities. We all remember people getting scooped up into vans, that might be what they're referring to. Um, so yeah, can this be geared toward whole groups, whole um, offices, departments? Okay, Tim, that's a very good question. And that's a question that I think is important that we didn't necessarily highlight as much, which I will go a little bit into that here in a minute. Um, in essence, it would work in individual and group situations. However, um, a lot of times, you know, they'll say, well, we need the identity of the officer in order to make, you know, in order to do that, which if they're concealing their identity and stuff like that, that makes it a lot harder. Or like but, covered their badge number. <laughs> yeah, that definitely uh, complicates the situation. But going into what makes it a little bit more difficult is we kind of briefly touched on hyperfragmentation, but I, we didn't really dive a little bit deeper, which I think um, is important to mention, especially out in these smaller suburbs. Within the confines of the city of Pittsburgh, you might not see it as often unless it's an interaction between maybe the Pittsburgh schools police and the city police or university and hospital or something like that. However, once you go outside of the city into a lot of the smaller suburbs, like, you know, especially I, I'm from the Mon Valley, so I can speak a lot more of the Mon Valley. You've got places where you might be in one town, but that officer is busy. So an officer from a responding town might have to come in and so forth. Or you might have an incident where you've got police officers from five different boroughs responding, which definitely complicates it. So that's part of the rationale that we used for uh, making the map. So that way you can see if you were if you find yourself in a region, like if I'm in a northern suburbs, which I'm not as familiar with, and uh, something happens and there's a lot of police from other suburbs, I might not even know who are the neighboring suburbs. So the map can also kind of help you plot that out. But that's the thing. They, uh, and sometimes you don't really even know, and it might not even be the local police that are responding. We also have other communities like even out here, just within the uh, Mon Valley, you've got on top of municipal police, we've got state police that operate in certain neighborhoods. We have county police that operate in some neighborhoods. So, you know, we just recently had another merger between uh, Wilmerding and Pitcairn police now. Well, not a merger, but where, you know, so it, it's the map is kind of to help identify if you don't know, but typically because of record keeping, they will know what officers are on the call. But unfortunately, the burden should not be on us to do that, but the burden is still sometimes kind of on us to do that because we've also seen the situations in which 
um, officers' identities were withheld, even when people have appealed to the uh, local municipality and said, well, we want to know who was the officer that did this. And for over a year, they protected the identity. I hope that answered your question. I, I, you might not have liked the answer, but I hope it helped because <laughs> I don't like the answer. We do have another question from Alan who asks, would it be possible to make a tool like this available to currently incarcerated people um, to gather their experiences and to inform the data? I think Eliana probably has more to say about this, uh, but I, I know yeah, I was about to say, well, Emily's the tech person. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say um, it certainly, I, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. I think it's a great idea. I was going to have Eliana talk about like the background of that. Um, but I do think that that would be a great idea. I think um, that's a vulnerable population that would really benefit from a tool like this. So I think that's a really great point to bring up. Um, and like, we can certainly add it to, we have like a running agenda of things that we're like considering working on. So I'm, I'm gonna make a note of that. Um, Cause I, I do think that's a great idea. Yeah, um, I love that question. I, I hadn't thought of that before, but I love it. And I, I always, um, I think it's important too, to try to connect policing to incarceration because they are, you know, they're extremely linked. You arrest the person, you take them to the jail. But I think people sometimes think of them as like separate problems. Um, so I, I really like that explicit like linkage. Um, I guess it would have to be on paper, I think, because they, they're actually literally not allowed to use the internet, um, incarcerated people, <laughs> or at least in Allegheny County. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to say more in the chat, because I'm super curious, are you thinking of just trying to gather like what were your experiences during your arrest? Like, do you feel like you experienced misconduct? Um, and you can just, that's just really interesting. <laughs> Sorry, we can go to the next. Oh, oh no, if I, I just wanted to add a little bit more. Um, we have, that was also something that has kind of come up previously too about, uh, you know, the states uh, working on legislation for, um, uh, databases and stuff like that. So we kind of talked a little bit about that, but we're also, and I, I know like not everything is, you know, in a perfect world, an ideal world, absolutely. We would totally do something like that. But we also have to look at um, like liability and everything. I'm not saying that like people would lie or whatever, but we also, want to not try to target, like the tool right now is to help, um, is to help people with the existing processes. Like our tool does not file the complaint per se, but it links people with the information needed to file the complaint. So like, you know, we're not collecting data, like we're not collecting anything saying, oh, okay, you're reporting this to us. So we're going to compile all of this. Like we're not doing it, I guess, in that manner. I might've just missed, confused everything. Okay. Uh, I was making a, sorry. <laughs> I was making a face cause I was like Googling something else. <laughs> sorry, what were you gonna say? No, just speaking of the tool, we do have a follow up question from Emily um, talking about about one in four police departments in Allegheny County use body cameras um, as of 2021. And do you think this increasing as legislation passes? Do you see that happening? And if so, would the increased use of body cameras play a role in the website's usability and function? Oh, that. Oh, sorry. I could almost tie that in with the last question a little bit where, like I said, this is the tool to, you know, kind of clear up that process and kind of hold your hand and walk you through step by step. Personally, I'm speaking as Blair, not University of Pittsburgh or ACPP or whatever, but um, I, I 
I, I don't understand why they wouldn't want to use body cams anyway, because if someone is filing a complaint and the body cam can basically confirm exactly what they were saying happened, then that should be end of story. However, with unions and with some of the different budgets of these police departments, like we're seeing more and more police departments going bankrupt, which is when the state or county or another municipality has to step in. So it, it would make, I don't know if this tool necessarily would increase body cams because that's something that is just like a no brainer that should be happening. However, um, uh, do you see this increasing as, oh, oh, that's not really about the tool that much. Okay. Um, well, kind of is. Do you see it increasing? I do see it increasing because a lot of us are fed up. We're seeking accountability. And one of the number one ways of obtaining accountability is not only having police cams, but having uh, body cams turned on. You know, a lot of times, even if we look at, let's jump outside of this state of uh, Pennsylvania right now, let's look at what just happened with Ahmaud Aubrey down in Georgia. Had that not been recorded, the outcome would have been completely different. Even when the police responded and everything, that information, their body cam information wasn't necessarily available. And the DA took that opportunity to try to sweep everything under the rug and pretend that, you know, nothing, nothing to see here, guys. But no. So I do think that with um with body cam and everything, the usability and function wouldn't necessarily be affected. However, it would make it easier to help uh, the complainant organize and be able to say, okay, there was this officer and so forth. So it might help them with being able, you know, it kind of gives you tips and stuff to look for, or whatever, to be able to file the complaint, you know, information you'll need. So it might help you identify, you know, like if you use the website, you go in there and realize, okay, yeah, I need the officer's badge number. I need this information. And that in turn can be also put on uh, the complaint and submitted to where if they use these body cams, they would be able to go back and view the body cam if they use it and have it turned on. So, yeah, there's that. Got to turn it on to work. Oh, if do other people have stuff to add? Okay, because that was a really, really good answer. Mine is uh, kind of a separate route and more depressing because um, I, I was thinking it it will make a difference because I imagine um, if if they do uh, excuse me if departments do buy more body cams I would imagine language to start showing up in contracts to limit the release of those recordings <laughs> uh, I I was that's I was trying to search real quick the word like camera body recording and I I couldn't find exactly what I was looking for off the top of my head. Um, but here is actually just a link to uh, the body worn camera policy of Pittsburgh. It's on their website. I haven't fully read it, but you can skim through it to see kind of some of the the language in there that basically says can't release it to the public and we have to delete it once a year that kind of deal. So. Um, I sincerely hope that there would be some more accountability with that as well as as Blair is saying, but I would also expect it to be accompanied by uh, trying to um, to defang the reform as much as possible. Um, speaking of reform, I just a general type of question for the panel on do you what what vibe do you get or what kind of feelings do you get with the new administration and with Mayor Ganey? Do you think um, the needle's gonna get moved a little bit? Blair's laughing at me, so <laughs> maybe she has some thoughts. Um, so I'm just curious about what, what this group's thought process is. I mean, that, that's a Blair question if I ever heard one. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to add some too, but if... <laughs> Oh no, Blair was trying to squirm out of avoiding this question. <laughs> no, um, I think a lot remains to be seen. I I will say, re regardless of you know things that have happened, we did see the uh, previous administration taking a strong stand against uh, police misconduct, which 
unfortunately, there were areas where uh, he had spoken out where he was maybe a little bit uninformed where maybe this tool could have helped him a little because even as a mayor, you know, the relations and stuff with a police union is so complicated. Even a lot of mayors don't understand him. He's been mayor for how long? But I am optimistic uh, with the new administration. Mayor Ganey has made it abundantly clear that this is one of the areas that he's going to focus on. Now, what happens remains to be seen because we all know politicians tell us exactly what we want to hear. And fortunately, your lovely crew over here at ACPP will tell you mm, maybe the things you don't want to hear. But I will say, like, this is for all of uh, Allegheny County. So Pittsburgh's is one locality within which we do have the most information on. So you, uh, Pittsburghers are lucky in this situation. But I will say that hopefully this tool will be able to help uh, basically help our current administration, you know, file these complaints and do things because he supposedly is going to be very responsive to these. So get familiar with the process processes. Uh, I know there's been like some ballot initiatives and ballot questions and stuff regarding the role of this uh, community uh, police civilian police review board. So if nothing else, this tool could be a vessel to kind of carry um, the public into actually saying things because if I go and tell my neighbor Bob, hey, this happened to me with this police officer and so forth, there is nothing on paper. There's nothing formal. There is no investigation besides Bob and I sitting together on Google trying to figure out what to do. So with this tool, we're hoping that it can be used to aid this cur current administration to do what he said he wants to do. And then my uh, my less diplomatic answer. <laughs> Uh, no, um, so I, I guess I'm sort of the moment I use the word reform, I immediately was like, because oh, I, I generally uh, am not a fan of anything that increases police budgets and buying body cameras does that. So I'm I'm not a huge fan of that generally. Um, in terms of uh, of Mayor Ganey, I know he has talked a lot about community policing, um, which I'm also personally not a fan of as Eliana, not as a representative of the University of Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, however, uh, I know that he did fire the, or I don't know if it's fire or had him resign, the director of public safety. Um, and Blair might know more about this, but the director of public safety supervises uh, or like is uh, the boss of the, the police and actually has uh, a lot of power in discipline, like whether or not officers get disciplined. So to me, that could be somewhat heartening that uh, there could be someone who is more willing to, to hold officers accountable. So at least it'd be nice if there was that little, <laughs> that little bit. <laughs> I know we're running short on time or, oh, I'm sorry, I might have um, overstepped. I did see a couple more questions. I think I can answer uh, Jason. Um, your question basically about um, efficacy and so forth right now and it's something that maybe can be explored in the future but right now like i said we're not necessarily gathering information so we're i know you're just like wait a group of researchers not gathering information what we're what this tool currently is is a tool for the community it's not necessarily benefiting us as you know students or university in terms of research in any way and like I said, we're not connect, collecting data, so we can't really do that. I know uh, the Office of Municipal Investigation, they release stuff which is typically very vague. You know, the Office of Municipal, uh, I know Public Source, for instance, has kind of dug into them a little bit and showed how certain officers have had X amount of complaints because they don't release complaint information to the public. And that's something that would require a lot more, <laughs> a lot more muscle, a lot more uh, manpower, a lot more strength to really try to be able to get the actual information. We can't, we have no way of following up. And then Jessica asked a good question. I, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to go through because I see we're like running short on time here. Uh, can your tool help someone who was harmed by a university police officer or are there tools specifically targeted at university police? So in, um, in a nutshell, eventually I believe we are going to move in that direction. Right now we've only kind of 
Right now, we've only focused on um, municipal police because their contracts are a little bit easier to obtain when we start dealing with uh, private entities or, you know, in some cases, public entities. University of Pittsburgh is a public institution. It's more so a uh, process of getting, like Eliana mentioned, getting a contract was like performing root canals in some situations. Nobody wants us to really know what they're doing. But in theory, we want to be able to have it for all of the police in Allegheny County. It's just with there being different levels of police, we're currently focused on municipalities, but hey, you're a member of the community and we solicit community feedback. So that is definitely something that we will probably discuss. Yeah, that's a question that we, we have gotten a couple times and it's, it is a really, really good question, especially because we're at Pitt and because uh, as Blair possibly referenced earlier, there may have been a University of uh, Pittsburgh police former employee who went on to work for East Pittsburgh, which no longer exists as a police department. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, I think even though it is a public institution, I'm not sure if they have to respond to right to know requests. And then I know the private universities definitely don't have to. Um, I would really, really like us to learn more. Right now, I, I've been I truly I've been thinking about this. Like, how do we do it? What's the strategy? And I haven't come up with anything yet, but <laughs> I'm, somebody here will, and we'll do it. <laughs> and uh, Nancy, I see your question, but I will advise that uh, whoever answers your question will be answering from their personal perspective and not from the University of Pittsburgh, not as an official representative of Gispia or any other affiliations that we may have. I'll just add that before anybody answers. I was gonna see if anyone else wanted to. Okay, my very quick answer is, um, yeah, I, I personally definitely support defunding with the ultimate goal of abolition. Um, but I do, I, it's, it's like a negative framing. Um, you know, like defunding the police sounds almost like punitive. Um, it's sort of the way that someone phrased it to me once, which seemed a little weird, but um, but like the goal of it, right, is not just to take something away. It is to, you know, implicit in that idea is to invest uh, in social services and build communities. So I like stuff like fund communities, not cops, but that's still uh, not quite the right note. Um, but that's how I personally feel. And Blair's perspective. Um, Blair, yes, the uh, process of defunding, I think, is definitely necessary. Uh, I think it's a lot of this is a play on words. And in a sense, because defunding can mean different things for different people. Uh, abolition can mean different things to different people, even though Ileana is on a crusade to get everybody on the same page with that definition. Um, there, there's, you know, re defunding can be so many different things. I personally like the word reimagine, reform, but even reform to me sounds a little um, tepid per se. I like and my, as previously mentioned, I also am a student in the School of Social Work because I can't do just one thing. I'm, it's a Gemini in me, apparently. But I, I definitely do think that police budgets need to be reduced in order to fund other um, community organizations, other initiatives, other diversionary type programs, because if you meet basic needs, if people are housed in safe housing, if people are fed, if people are warm, if their Maslow's hierarchy of needs are met, you're going to have a much lower reduction in crime. There's lots of research, there's lots of academic journals and articles by people that have been studying this for a long time that say that. Like I said, I, I from Blair's perspective, I am also a first responder as well. I am not a police officer. So it's okay, you guys can still like me. I'm a firefighter. People love firefighters, but I know even from my experience, I've gone out on several calls. I 
was in class this week, so I missed one. But even this past week, we had a call that was not a fire call, not a police call, even though we have to wait for the police to arrive because it was a mental health call. If you look at the call uh, volume, the call data for a lot of the calls, a lot of them are regarding mental health, mental illness, and you know other things that have become criminalized that don't need to be criminalized. Homelessness is not a crime. Mental illness is not a crime. So the fact that we are funneling money into a police system to deal with problems like this is a little bit asinine to me. We see a lot of substance abuse. Well, maybe if we could get into why there's a lot of substance abuse, address the substance abuse so that police interaction is not necessary. So police should not be responding to mental health calls. Police should not be responding to a lot of calls that they respond to. They are being given calls in areas they have no training. I've done an extensive background into uh, what police training entails. For instance, the number of hours of training that police officers receive. Like, let's, let's, let's have a moment of sympathy for our police officers. Their number one cause of death is not homicide. Their number one cause of death among police officers is suicide. Yet they get, eh, in Pennsylvania, maybe about less than eight hours of suicide training or mental health in general training. But yet in their own lives, they can't maintain their mental health. Um, vehicle accidents is another, you know, cause of death. Yet they get the same 40 hours training that I get as a firefighter. And that, you know, so I don't think taking money from the police officers is going to hurt them in any way. If anything, taking money from police officers to bolster these community supports will also help them in turn. And I also look at it like we're not necessarily taking just money from them. We'll take tasks from them too, because if they're not having to respond to as many things as they're responding to, their call volume's going to decrease, which means that less are needed, which means they need less money. So funding the community and not police, I think is definitely the way to go. But like I said, there's a play in terminology, so it could be a bunch of different words, but in essence, re completely get rid in a sense, completely get rid of police, build it up from the ground up, because if we're keeping it real, we all know what police in the United States were established for. The police departments were built out of slave patrols to capture escaped slaves. And that is the basic of our American police system. So get rid of it and start all over. Blair's opinion. Okay, we did have a question that just uh, was referring to, um, did you consult and work with any community groups when you were um, developing the tool? You, um, you did cover this a little bit in the presentation and I think uh, that was responded to in the chat as well. I don't know if you wanted to add anything or reiterate anything there. Yes, that was responded to in the chat. So that's great. I was actually wondering, so Emmeline, you referenced kind of a running list of to do's or initiatives that were kind that you're that you're kind of looking at. I was wondering if you were able to share any of those or or talk about anything that might be coming up. Um, yeah, so we actually um... In, in the fall met with um, an organization in Minnesota, Communities United Against Police Brutality. Um, and they are doing work that's similar to us um, and are sort of at, at the heart of where everything went down with George Floyd. Um, and so they have kind of requested uh, like to migrate the tool to their location um, because obviously the tool is very uh, local, like it is, adapted for Pittsburgh, adapted for Allegheny County and the hyperfragmentation here. Um, and so we are gonna be looking at how we can adapt this tool to other places and other areas um, and see like how plausible, how easy that process is going to be so that this can be more than just Pittsburgh, more than just Allegheny County. And we can you know, expand how many people we're helping with this tool. 
So that's sort of our big um, next project that we're working on. Um, and then as Eliana mentioned, we are, I think we have been having some discussions about like, what other kinds of police are we gonna be looking at? Like university police or stuff like that. Um, but I think those are like the, the major goals that we are considering right now. And then, you know, just perfecting this tool and listening to more feedback and getting, getting what we can to help the community. I got a question. I it, it came to me personally because there was a personal message. So I think um, it was supposed to go back to the group. But sometimes if you PM a person at PM. OK, anyway, the question was basically um, to talk about Resolve Crisis Network, which I, I, I can kind of briefly. Um, I love the concept of Resolve, but I can't really um, I can't really talk too greatly about the efficacy of it. I know the problem that I have with Resolve, which is a very great resource. I've seen Resolve help people that were literally clinging to the side of a bridge. So it, it, it does work. However, it works when it, uh, sometimes it works when it um, is functioning, when someone's able to get through. Um, sometimes people can't reach Resolve. They're there 24 seven, but maybe there's too much need in the community that Resolve can't keep up with it. They don't have the capacity. Another uh, situation that Resolve does contact police officers. If there is a situation, Resolve will send the police out, which especially if they can't make it there, which is pretty traumatic to, especially if we're dealing with a child, that they will still send the police officers out to address a child in crisis. So Resolve also could be uh, reworked a little bit. They are a resource, but they're a resource that doesn't necessarily do as much as they can would like to potentially do but they are still there and please call them if you ever need to um did betty have a question i did dm betty um to to inquire what her question was um but also we have a question from michael asking what kinds of community needs assessment do you work with meaning sociology based or or a different kind I was, I was going to make Blair do it since she's uh, in the social work program is more on the, the theory and the needs assessments. Um, I am maybe not. Um, yeah, that feels like kind of a social work question, but uh, I, we do definitely take like a, a sociology based approach. Um, maybe your question is like more specialized than I'm aware of, but I, I'm not sure how to answer it. Uh, so, yeah, definitely add more clarity. Oh, go ahead. Blair. Oh, yeah, no, I was about to say I kind of see where. Um... I kind of see where it's coming from and everything, but I, I think we might be starting to go a little farther off because our tool, um, we do take a, a, well, I'd love to take a strengths-based approach, at, you know, especially like analyzing the strengths in a community and so forth and taking that approach because I personally think that that's the best approach. But if anything, I think the tool is more so just um, providing a little bit more self-efficacy or providing that ability, I can't say that we're necessarily empowering because you empower yourself. We could suggest it, but everybody empowers themselves. But I think the tool is more so just empowering people to be able to take a stand, you know, um, report what needs to be reported, learn about, you know, the empowerment comes from learning how to handle these situations, which we recommend doing it in advance because if something happens and you're in that state of mind to where you can't think clearly, then that can be a problem all the way around. But I would definitely say that we're not, we're basically helping the community help themselves in these situations without taking a specific approach per se. Uh, oh, also just, you know, part of it is that um, most of us, yeah, I guess, Three, three of the four of us are um, at the, the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, um, where our, our school and our professors have a lot of like working relationships with municipal government employees. 
And there's always the potential that this will seem as though we're being like, oh, I shouldn't even pick the name of a municipality. Uh, it's like, you, you hate Ross Township for no reason. You know, like we, we do have to be kind of careful um, and sort of try to be neutral. It's kind of a, a, a fine line to walk, but that's sort of where we're coming from. I, I did get a question from Betty, um, and it is along the lines of just kind of responding, respondents. Um, how can training 911 operators, um, how can training them uh, to better direct calls uh, to more appropriate departments? Like, is that, um, how, how can that help? How do we see that helping? That is an excellent question. Um, I can find myself sometimes being very critical. I, <laughs> I am one of those weird people that also sit here and listen to the police scanner constantly. And there are many times where I am yelling, why are you doing this? Why are you sending the police? This is not a police manner. So um, I do think that 911 operators do hold a uh, significant role in this. Like I said, there's a lot of things that, you know, police officers don't necessarily need to be doing. And if the operators just by default, like, hey, there's a hole in the middle of the streets and the police, there's a this and the police, there's a cat in a tree, send the police. Oh, wait, send the fire department too, but send the police. But um, I, I will also say, and this is uh, uh, at Gispia, there is also, um, I also work with Connect, which is the Congress of Neighboring Communities. And through Connect, there is also the LEAD program, which is Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, which Many people are for, many people are against, but it is a diversionary process that involves the police officers to kind of decriminalize a lot of acts that may not necessarily be criminal, but somehow they are considered criminal, which still makes no sense, which is basically a way of diverting individuals away from the um, criminal justice system. So even though it's not necessarily hand in hand, that is something I would encourage uh, people to look at and, you know, come up with their own decision and so forth about that. But it is having, I know the city of Pittsburgh recently just hired uh, social workers. I know other municipalities have hired social workers that kind of work with the police, which I, <laughs> I have, I have problems with that as well. I definitely think social workers should be doing more of the stuff that police do, but I don't think they should be doing it hand in hand with police officers. Once again, this is Blair speaking. A social worker that works at a police department is under undue influence of the police chief and not necessarily the National Association of Code uh, Social Workers Code of Ethics and so forth. So I can see some conflicts there. But once again, keep social workers separated from the police officers and use them as a resource more so than police, but don't put them in the same bucket by any means. Blair's opinion. All right, well, that brings us right up to time. So thank you all very much for participating. That was a great chat, everyone. Um, and thank you to our presenters. I did post a survey um, from the summit. If you could give us some feedback on the session, that would be greatly appreciated. I posted it in the chat a couple of times. Um, but other than that, thank you all again for for, for coming and attending today. And thank you to the presenters and uh, enjoy the rest of the summit. Thanks everybody. Coming out on a Saturday morning. Thanks yeah. everyone. Great questions. <laughs>